Chinatowns are shrinking. Can you save them? And if so, what does it take? Yeah, I mean, topics like this have been going viral for several years now. I think Philly's Chinatown is the most recent one to get national attention because they're thinking about building a new 76ers arena right next to it, which they feel like will destroy it, just like DC's Chinatown got destroyed. However, Andrew, every local paper of every major city in America that has a Chinatown has had this in the news for the past couple of years, how to save Chinatown. Chinatowns are disappearing. They're being encroached on by developers. Gentrification, the older generation is moving on. Young people are not moving back, Andrew. What can people do? Yeah, well, we've actually made multiple videos of this over the years, guys, so we're going to address it. But we also have, you know, gained a lot of knowledge and perspective from talking to local business owners, older generation, the younger generation, even politicians, kind of people who are involved on things. So these are our solutions. These are not end-all, be-all solutions. I'm not saying that we can all do all of these things at the same time, but... You let me know in the comments down below what you think because this is something that we have thought a lot about. So make sure you like, subscribe, turn on your notifications. Andrew, let's get into what realistically needs to happen in order for Chinatowns in America to sustain and uh, thrive and survive. Andrew, what is the first thing that people probably, they, 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 it's, it's difficult to say this, but like the first thing that needs to happen before we even get into solutions. I, I think the one thing that people need to remember is that the system that allowed Chinese to come here, build Chinatowns, make money, and move out of Chinatowns. Right, to, to the suburbs to raise their kids to be professionals, whether that's uh, STEM or anything else. Is the same system that is kind of, at times, shrinking and pushing Chinatown You're out. You're talking about the ebbs and flows, the waxing and waning of just capitalism. Yes, capitalism. The, I, the, the, the chase of money. And like, I mean, obviously Chinese are very well known for starting businesses, working very hard, Globally. working long hours, doing a lot of trade. This is something that a lot of people, that this is what Chinese people started doing when they came to America. But I'm just saying like, we, we can't be shocked anymore about the system. We just have to understand the system that we're in and then we can move forward and make, and, and make solutions. I, I think you're right. And um, yeah, but moving on to the solutions, Andrew. Second generation Chinese Americans or Cantonese people or Fujianese people, you know, every Chinatown sort of has a different makeup, but originally there were a lot of people from Toisan, right? Or Cantonese speaking people need to come back and collaborate with other Chinese that are wealthy to what? Build new businesses that appeal to the current crowd living in Chinatown or spending their money in Chinatown, but also to people outside of Chinatown to bring in foreign capital inflows, right? Yeah, the key is, guys, Chinatown cannot be the same as it was 30 years ago. And even though that there is a beauty to a lot of the old businesses that have been around, not all of the 50-year-old businesses can still exist. Some of them will, and some of them are, are great businesses, and they need to be supported. However, you do need the next generation to come back and open up businesses that can appeal to everybody. It's true. You need it. This, this heavily relies on the second generation. And actually, all like historical ethnic enclaves that are about 100 years old right now are going through it. Little Italy's, mm -hmm. little Armenia's, little Greek uh, areas, et cetera. Somebody said uh, you need the building owners a.k.a. the people who probably got rich off the equity bounce over holding their buildings for several years to give favorable leases to what? Businesses with good intentions, right? Yeah, building owners, land owners, they essentially have control and get to pick which businesses get to open up down below. Right, because the who, who they're renting to or who they're selling the entire block to, right? Exactly. So whoever they sell the building to or who is opening up a shop in their building, obviously it's all essentially up to them. Now, I'm not telling people not to make money. I think that it is very hard to tell people not to take like profit, but you have to. Right. Wow. Somebody said uh, they need the younger generation of customers, not just the business owners, to still support and attend the old classic businesses as well as the new modernized ones that the ABCs are opening up. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some classic businesses in every Chinatown that have existed for 30 plus years that will continue to exist because people just love them. So you still need to support them to make sure that they do not go away that quickly. However, like... I, I can't just put it on the rich business owners. I have to put it on the customers themselves. Right. We also, as a second generation or even tourists, they need to come in and support the businesses that they and like. you know, I noticed that it's really different. Like some businesses like me, some Andrew in New York's Chinatown were started in like 1950. And then some new classics, like for example, Great NY Noodle Town, which is viewed as a, uh, as a stalwart or like a institution that was made in the 90s. 
So that's still a 40 year span, but like you said, they're both classics. Exactly. Somebody said, uh, people gotta be ready for Chinatown to change and morph. It's not gonna look the same as 30 years ago. 30 years ago didn't look the same as 30 or 40, 50 years ago before that. It has to be ready to enter a new phase of evolution. Yeah, and one thing that a lot of people need to think about is that, you know, just because the Chinatown in the downtown is shrinking or morphing or changing, that doesn't mean that's a full on L for Chinese people in general because there's actually way more little Chinatowns popping up everywhere else. Right. So as a whole, there's more Chinese restaurants, more Chinese business, even more Chinese commerce than there was 30 years ago, even though Chinatown itself might be shrinking. Yeah, I would agree with that. I don't think it's the same case in every city like New York, how people say there's like eight or nine Chinatowns now instead of one only. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, in Philly, I'm sure there are certain pockets in certain suburbs that have a plaza now and things like that. And things may be more dispersed. Maybe it's not the same energy anymore. But uh, yeah, who knows? Like things, they, 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 they grow, they get weaker here, but they get stronger here too, to your point. Somebody said uh, they also need to maintain rent control housing so that working class people can still live their entire lives in Chinatown in terms of they wake up, they go to work, they go to sleep, spend their money within these smaller dense zones. Yeah, I mean, working class Chinese immigrants are one of, if not the backbone of Chinatowns. So how do you incentivize them to still live in the city? Well, you have to make it affordable for them. So this is like kind of, this comes down to the government or the building owner or whatever it is, guys. These are usually powers a little bit beyond what we as customers can do, but they do need rent controls so they can live there. Yeah. What do you think about building new, more modern businesses like a Chinatown, you know, gym or like, you know, obviously local bars, anything that can maintain people uh, outside people coming in or maintaining the same people to spend the money to stimulate the economic uh, cash inflows and just circulation within the community. Yeah, I mean, maybe if you look at Chinatown as its own like separate country, you need like foreign investment and you need foreign currency to come into that country. So just like you need money from outside of the community to come into Chinatown and sustain Chinatown. So you do like if you could build a gym or obviously bars that are, are appealing to the next generation or even tourists and non-Asians, that's also very important. Right, and I think that that's to the point, our next point about how do you design Chinatown from a decor, vibe, ambiance, atmospheric, energy way. Yeah, I think if you make Chinatowns very bright and ornamental, okay, and make it look very cool and that people are gonna care more about Chinatown. They're gonna wanna go there more. Like putting lanterns al along the top of New York Chinatown uh, about two, three years ago during the pandemic, it really helped a lot. Oh, it and it, it kind of made it look more like Yokohama, Japan Chinatown. Yeah, and Yokohama Chinatown in Japan is like the cleanest, biggest Chinatown that I've ever been to. Um, what about political leaders, nonprofit leaders, you know? Yeah. Obviously, political leaders, who you elect as your political leaders that represent, you know, this district that Chinatown is in is very important. So they have to care because they're going to help fight for you. Um, also, uh, there is a lot more organizations and nonprofits. There's a lot more people who have professional jobs whose livelihoods don't rely on Chinatown, but spend their free time organizing things for Chinatown. And that's very important because as we know, Asians, oftentimes, you know, you study hard, you get a good job and you uh, make like a good living, but also what can give you purpose on the outside uh, after work, right? Right, Is right, like, right. You mean not just in, like maybe moving to the suburbs or getting that one like condo in that, you know, adjacent city and just like yeah. living that yappy life. Um, this maybe something more keeps that fire burning inside of you. I mean, I think it varies person to person. And uh, what do you think about gentrification? Just needing to accept that some of it's going to happen, but also knowing that there's different types of gentrification, like gentrification from modern second gen businesses, which I don't even know if it counts as gentrification if the kids grew up in Chinatown, but like, uh, it's just no, you know what I mean? Like that's different than like outside people coming in and making like six blocks, just a bunch of non-Asian businesses. Yeah, no, I would say that gentrification is bound to happen because we're talking about Chinatown is situated in downtowns. Most, mostly they're all in downtown, especially downtown New York. This is prime real estate. So of course you have to, uh, accept that it's going to happen on some level, but at least you need it to happen by people who want to uphold the culture. They don't have to be Chinese but they need to want to uphold the culture. Yeah. That's important. I think Chinatown's becoming more pan-Asian, Asian towns, as well as more condensed, but in a way higher quality and having the speed of capital inflows sped up in there is, uh, it's like a good compromise. Yeah. As opposed to obviously the entire thing disappearing off the map.
Uh, David, so we talked to a lot of business owners and we've learned, we've walked into a lot of businesses. We filmed at a lot of businesses. What are some like quick business considerations? This is for people who maybe have an idea of a business they want to open up in Chinatown. What, what are some questions they need to answer when trying to open up something in Chinatown to help the next generation? All right. If you really want to help Chinatown, but obviously you're still going to be concerned with ROI return on investment. It's not evil to want to make money off your business. And everybody who does like 97% of jobs, 98% of jobs doesn't do it for charity, but it doesn't mean that you can't see ROI on a profitability end and still impact the community positively. I think you have to remember that ROI and community impact can obviously go together. Right. So I guess what are some business considerations, just some questions that they need to be answering? I think, for example, you need to go, um, how much homage are you trying to make and make it appeal to like what generations are you trying to appeal to are you trying to appeal to just people who grew up in chinatown and live every day there or outside people and what's your ratio mix obviously what would be beneficial is a business that appeals to both because mm -hmm. you're pulling from two major economic pools rather than um one isolated one um how much are you going to spend on your decor vibe andrew probably for modern businesses that want to appeal to outside people as well as inside people they're going to need to be cool right yeah yeah, for sure. And then you want to make it Instagrammable, guys. This is how it is. And there are, obviously, we have some friends' businesses that are opening up that look very cool in Chinatown. So I think they are leading the way. And I think for, if you're trying to open up a spot, Andrew, it's almost like, what are you trying to say to the world? If you look at uh, Corey's Potluck Club, shout out to Corey, he's trying to say a lot. Mm -hmm. He's trying to just pay homage to his childhood and all the Hong Kong cinema or uh, Cantonese things that we all grew up with. Right. So there's a very strong messaging there rather than like, oh yeah, I, I had a product that's high margin, so I tried to sell it. Right. Also, another question is like, who's going to run the system and how do you incentivize other Asians or Chinese people uh, if that's who you want to run your system? How do you incentivize them to come into Chinatown and work? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's important, you know, the operations that matters, your cost of goods sold, supply chain legal, taxes, Excel spreadsheets, the landlord, you got to worry about the triple net. There's so much stuff that goes into it. And uh, the reason we're talking about these details right now is because if you're out there and you're watching, I want to show you, not discourage you, I want to encourage you, but also give you the reality of how complicated it can be. All right, so here we. this is at the point in time in this video where we want to give a shout out to some of the new restaurants in New York's Chinatown that we think are doing a great great job that are kind of leading the next generation of Chinatown. The new phase. Yeah, that I think not every business that opens has to be like them, and maybe they shouldn't, but I'm just saying these are good examples of things that we like. And also, you know, having been to a lot of Chinatowns from Toronto, San Francisco, Seattle, L.A., we've been to Boston, Philly, New York. We've been to a lot of Chinatowns. Like, these are the things that we, we like. So these are three spots, Andrew, that just opened up in the past year that are doing Neo Chinatown American, Americana Golden Age Hong Kong, Potluck Club, Soft Swerve, Mabu Cafe. Oh. This is a good aesthetic that a lot of Cantonese people, which primarily make up the most of Chinatowns, they like this. Yeah. Some other businesses that we like are 12 Pell. I know that they are what they're providing to people understanding haircuts is amazing. Their haircuts are way more expensive than the Chinatown ones that are $13, but it's a way different experience. But they show a lot of love to every, to both, and they're all a lot of local no, they, guys. They make it worth it. It's not just like 50, you sit down and then get out of my chair, right? Yeah. They're, they're offering like a whole analysis of your hair and your head shape. Um, shout out to actually HBX, Hypebeast.com, Andrew. They actually opened up in Chinatown. They are originally a blog from Hong Kong that opened up their first American store in Chinatown. Yeah, I do think that they show a lot of homage to Chinatown and to Chinese culture in general, although, of course, that is a, a expensive retail uh, streetwear store. Another thing that we've noticed for a long time, Andrew, is that there are Chinese-owned Japanese chains in Chinatown that mm. add a lot of value. Now, some people go, oh, how can, you know, it's Japanese, it's not Chinese, but I'm like, well, the owners are still Chinese and they're making these Japanese concepts very accessible, whether it's Ajisen snacks or, you know, Japanese cheese tarts or tea swirls, Japanese crepes that are right, like, right. like, what do you think of this? Because like a, this there, is kind of a thing right now where Chinese are licensing or building their own Japanese brands, but the, the cultural product or food product they're selling is Japanese. Yeah, there's like a small Tesso life like in Chinatown. That's something that you probably wouldn't have expected. However, I will say there was always shops in Chinatown that served Japanese snacks, but they weren't necessarily chains from Japan. Yeah. So now you do get some chains from Asia and I think that is going to happen more in Chinatown. Now, I don't I don't think it'll take over Chinatown, but there is space in Chinatown for some of these 
uh, bigger chains to open. And if you've ever actually spent time specifically in Hong Kong or Taiwan, but a, a lot of places in Asia, Andrew, it doesn't matter where you grow up in Asia, you grow up eating Japanese snacks. Even if you sure. grow up in China or like anywhere in Asia. It's true. Japanese snacks probably overall, I got to say, are the best. I've been in Malaysia in a 7-Eleven and seen like full on Japanese snacks that have been relabeled. Um, what about traditional Toysan food, you know, for the, the, the low wok you know, the older 60, 70, 80, 90 year old generation. Yeah, Uncle Lou's I think is a great example. I mean, it's a, has kind of an updated look and the dishes are actually still pretty fairly priced for what you get. And also, you know, they're serving a lot of traditional like Toysan food there. What about diasporic Chinese foods mixing with Southeast Asian Chinese via Chinese Cambo, Thai wontons, Chinese Thai? Like this is something that I'd like to even see more of. And I think that there probably were some more spots uh, maybe 15 years ago open in Chinatown. However, this, this even group of people, because the diaspora is so specific from that time period and from that story. Well, of, where Southern Chinese went yeah. all over Southeast Asia, right? Yeah, or even having to move around between Thailand and Cambodia during the war from Vietnam that are Chinese, and then they come here. That's a specific story that their next generation is, cannot replicate, obviously. So I think that I would like to see more of these restaurants open again if a second generation chef could do it. Yeah, I would you like see to see a lot it. of uh, Cantonese from Penang and Malaysia coming in now as well. Uh, but shout out to all the Chiu Jiao people. And what about places like Art Bean, like Pan Asian hipster coffee shops, where they have like an ube, uh, uji matcha. They have like a Korean barley yeah. tea on the menu as well as a Hong Kong milk yeah. tea. They're being super Pan Asian. This this would be a good example of of people who are doing something different. You know, there's the coffee is like more expensive than your average coffee, but it is also. Uh, really upholding the culture and being very involved in the community. I think Dong Liang Hot Pot is uh, Ma La Tong is very great. It's great because that's actually a chain from China that opened up, but everybody in Chinatown likes it. What do you think about this new trend? Because Andrew, for a long time, chains from the mainland did not really enter the American market, but now there's quite a few. Like yeah. Yun Shang is there. I think that sure. it's something that people need to embrace. I know the older Cantonese people, they're not necessarily going to go get Gang Guo or Ma La Tong. Yeah. But try it out. It's pretty tasty. Yeah, and you know, you need bars like uh, Basement and Nori to be around for, like, local people to come to. And anyways, you need nightlife. I mean, you need your watering holes. That's that's what a community is because you have your regulars, you have your crowd, and that's what brings in a lot of, like, that nightlife. Um, because, honestly, people go for the bar. They go eat food later at night. I know, it's for example, in Seattle, Andrew, the Vietnamese American community or the Vietnamese Seattle community has done a great job of modernizing the Vietnamese coffee shop and made it really almost like a museum. It's hipster. It's advanced. Uh, I saw a lot of that in Boston as well. Yeah. So, guys, uh, you know, let us know what you guys think in the comments down below about how to save Chinatowns, things that you want to do. What are some things that you've seen done and what are some businesses that you really think should open up or could open up or have opened up that you really like? Yeah. I mean, do you think that people are doing this right now? I, I think people are beginning to usher in the new phase, but I'd like to see even more. Yeah. Guys, it's going to weigh heavily on the building owners and the second generation to come in there and open up modern businesses that can appeal to everybody, but mm. that still uphold the culture. It might Which is tricky. Well, it's difficult, I guess. It's not just something that like... Anybody with, like, the willpower to do it, they still would need, like, the thinking and then the execution. Hey, man, if you got an idea, you can ask us our thoughts and our, for our consultation. I'll gladly give you my, my feedback. Oh, but we have seen so many upstarts, so many failures, so many successes, people who are hanging on by a thread, people who made a bunch of money, people who made money and then dropped off. We've seen it all by now. All right, everybody, let us know in the comments down below. This video was about how to save Chinatown, and if you can... What does it take? You let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, we out. Peace.